Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Lutheran in a Strange Land. This is the conclusion to our six-part series on rape culture. There are links to the previous parts in the description below. Please watch those first. But if you're all caught up, which means you have stuck with us through this whole thing to the very end, then let's just get started. Last time, we talked about the misery of hookup culture and why rape culture is really just the same thing as hookup culture, which leaves us with one last question. How do we fix it? How do we fix this? Because we're not going to do it by doing what we have been doing so far, which is basically trying to build a, a draconian system of retribution based on this one metric of dehumanized consent. And we talked about the problem with that metric back in part two. But we should pause to consider some of the consequences of that. Because the stories of, of men in particular who are, who are unjustly accused or punished or had their reputations ruined or lost their careers based on that metric, that is multiplying. Those stories are multiplying all the time. And I'm going to give you one example. Uh, there, there are plenty more to choose from if you want to look it up. And all the details I'm about to describe are in, from a New York Times article that I'm going to put a link to in the description. The, the, man, the man in question was a graduate student at Michigan State, and he was also a uh, football player uh, for the Houston Texans. And he had a hookup, and the woman he hooked up with uh, ultimately accused him of rape. And he was investigated for this several times. The first investigation was by the police. Uh, and, well, he cooperated with them and, you know, gave them access to his phone and, and uh, their texts and, and so forth. Uh, she, on the other hand, the accuser, she did not cooperate with the police. And they found uh, certain evidence, including some video surveillance, that uh, cast doubt on her claims. And ultimately, they declined to prosecute it. The second investigation uh, was by his school's Title IX office. And Title IX offices, when, when, when they investigate... Uh, accusations of sexual assault, they have a much, much lower standard of evidence um, and far fewer protections for the accused as compared to the criminal justice system. But even there, uh, he was still uh, cleared of all wrongdoing in the case. But you know, there was a third investigation. And in the, in the third investigation, his accuser appealed that original decision at a school's Title IX office um, and, and was completely able to do that because there is no uh, protection from double jeopardy in Title IX. And so she reopened the uh, investigation, and so they started over again, and the only attempt that the school made to reach the accused was a single email to an address that he didn't even use anymore. So the investigation proceeded entirely without the accused even being aware of it. And this time, on the third investigation, he was finally found guilty of relationship violence and sexual misconduct. And the consequences of that were, first, uh, expulsion from the school. But it didn't end, it didn't end there, uh, because when the story first hit the newspapers, well, he ended up being fired by his football team as well, uh, be, be because of the accusation. Um, and Naturally, once all that happens, when, you, when you're expelled from school, lose your job, it's pretty hard getting onto any other team or getting into any other graduate program when everybody thinks you're a rapist. And as of the time of the writing of the article, at least, he was essentially being forced to sit out his prime earning years as a football player, um, all due to uh, that one accusation. And when it comes down to it, all of that... That's, that's a really harsh punishment to result from an accusation that, that was fairly dubious in the first place, and especially f from a uh, conclusion reached by a really shoddy investigation. I mean, the, the lack of due process rights at, at most universities is, is, is just shameful. And the impulse to simply believe all women without any kind of evidence, or regardless of any kind of evidence... That's just not workable in any jurisdiction where we have things like the rule of law or presumption of innocence or protections for the accused. And, and trying to sort out messes like that in, in a legalistic fashion when dehumanized consent is the only thing you're allowed to really consider, that is always going to result in stories like that. 
And absurd things like drunken hookups, they have become so routine that it's, it's there are just there are too many of them to really grapple with it in that way. Uh, consent is is not in any way a powerful enough concept for administrating meaningful justice in cases like this. So, yeah, the, what we're doing so far, which is trying harder and harder and harder to catch, prosecute more and more and more with fewer and fewer protections, that is not going to work in the long run. That that's just not a good solution for all of this. You're also not going to fix uh, rape culture by teaching men not to rape, which is the other go-to solution that you usually hear. And now, a lot of you are probably already thinking, wait, wait, Matt, how can you possibly be against teaching men not to rape? And the fact that so many people react that way is a testament to the power of deceptive rhetoric. Because fix rape culture by teaching men not to rape... That is highly deceptive rhetoric for two reasons. Number one, the reality is that virtually all men are already taught that we're not supposed to rape. Uh, I grew up Lutheran, so speaking for myself, you know what? I learned the Ten Commandments as a kid. You know, I learned them from Luther's small catechism. And the explanation for the Fifth Commandment, Thou shalt not kill, is that we should fear and love God, that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need. And that really obviously precludes rape. And of course, there's the sixth commandment as well, thou shalt not commit adultery, which the explanation is, we should fear and love God so that we live a chaste and decent life in word and deed. And that also obviously precludes rape. So yeah, I mean, I was certainly taught not to rape growing up, but it's not as though, you know, Lutherans are the only people who ever learned this. Every Christian is going to learn some version of do unto others based on scripture. And you know what? It's not just Christians either, because every non-Christian religion, every atheist, we're all taught some version of the golden rule, some basic moral standards rooted in natural law. So we are all already taught not to rape. It is a ridiculous condescension to think that American males are, are you know, oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm not supposed to force myself on women against their will? I had no idea. It's ridiculous. And, of course, there are exceptions to that because there are exceptions to everything. But the exceptions are not what is driving rape culture. And even in the case of those exceptions, there are deeper considerations at work, such as the culture uh, that people come from in cases like that. And a remedial course in not raping women, that is just, that's not going to fix anything. The second reason the whole teach men not to rape line is, is really deceptive rhetoric is because of that whole dehumanized consent problem. Because, as we talked about last time, I mean, there, there really is an attitude of sexual entitlement in America, and that attitude really is a problem. So could you then take, well, teach men not to rape as meaning teach men not to be sexually entitled? And you could, but you can't do it without sexual morality, without real sexual morality, something that goes beyond everything's okay as long as you have consent. Um, because we talked about that last time, too, the way that we, we take away any meaningful reason to say no, any reason to withhold consent. And as, as long as you have that, everything's okay as long as you have consent ethic, then you are also going to have rape culture because everybody's going to be wanting to get consent. Everybody's going to have that attitude of entitlement. You can't separate the two through instruction because the separation is nonsense. And as consent gets more and more dehumanized and becomes more and more like whim, then it also becomes more, even more nonsensical. You, you cannot just take whim and, and elevate it as if it's the most important thing in the world. And the feminists who push this line generally define rape extremely broadly as essentially a violation of consent in that dehumanized sense. Because their ethical philosophies preclude them from acknowledging anything other than that. So if you take that and you translate teach men not to rape based on that amoral understanding that's rooted in dehumanized consent, well, what you end up with is teach men to always submit to a woman's sexual whims. And no, 
No, I do not think men should be taught that. Most importantly, that is anti-biblical. Men are to be heads of their wives just as Christ is the head of the church. And, you know, maybe we'll, we'll cover the details of that in another series of videos someday. But for now, suffice it to say that Christ does not always submit to the whims of his church. You can't lead by always trying to satisfy whim. That is the exact opposite of leadership. And secondly, and this reason holds true regardless of what you think of the Bible, that is against the design of men and women. Because generally, women want and expect their husbands to lead them to some extent. Women are almost never sexually attracted to men who cannot take initiative, who cannot take the lead in a relationship. And by undermining, undermining a man's capacity and inclination to lead, you are setting them up for sexual failure, even when you consider marriage rather than just hookups. Unless you think I'm exaggerating, according to a recent article in The Economist, a full 25% of millennial men in the United States think that asking a woman out for a drink is sexual harassment. You know, good luck to those guys. There is a reason that we have to invent terms like incel these days. And now that you have a lot of men who have grown up being taught this way, to taught that, oh, you always need to submit to women, you also have a lot of men who have experienced the negative consequences of having been raised that way. And this is where you get the whole uh, the, the nice guy or, and bad boy dichotomy, or, or the friend zone, as, as it's more commonly called today. You know, a guy thinks that he is being just super nice by always being completely compliant with all the women around, that, uh, around him, and then he wonders why they never see him as anything more than a friend, or, or really even as a sexual being <laughs> in a lot of cases. And he can't shake that perception, because doing so wouldn't be submissive to the women around him. So you've got a lot of guys nowadays who, who feel like that they've done more or less everything that they were taught, they did everything they're supposed to do, but it's not working for them. Uh, they're still completely unsuccessful, despite having that same attitude of entitlement towards sex that the more successful people have. And so it's, it's, it's no wonder that they feel angry. It's no wonder that they feel betrayed by society. So teaching men not to rape in that sense of dehumanized consent is effectively nothing else than just teaching men to be really timid around women. And, and that's not how masculinity works. And that's not at all what women want from the men in their lives either. So the solution of teach men not to rape, if you're talking about rape in the traditional sense, then it's simply ineffective because we already know that. And if you're talking about rape in the sense of dehumanized consent, it is actually counterproductive because if you f try to force a sexual ethic that, that seriously harms a man's ability to have a family, which is the fundamental purpose of sex, whether you're looking for a family or not, men are going to start bucking against that sexual ethic. And the harder you push it, and the more injustice you promote while pushing it, the harder men are going to fight back against it. The more they associate or confuse the bad sexual ethic with real sexual morality, the more likely they are to just reject sexual morality as such. And the more that they see women reward sexual aggression uh, from other men, the more they're going to try and imitate the sexually aggressive men in, in very clumsy and harmful ways. And then when all that happens, you really do end up with a rape culture in the traditional sense of rape. And that is, I mean, that's why Hollywood is the way that it is. You have a lot of men with all these kinds of inclinations but who also suddenly have enough power that they can coerce women who are desperate for fame. I mean, you can think of it as, as a kind of pendulum. The harder you, you push a pendulum away from yourself, the harder it's going to smack you in the face when it swings back at you. And if women double down on this approach, then it is going to bend very, very badly for them in the long run and for everybody else in the long run as well. So teach men not to rape. That is not a solution. That's not a viable solution to rape culture. And you know what? The conservative approach, the conservative approach doesn't work either because you can't go back to uh, the uh, glory days of serial monogamy. Because now that the re sexual revolution has turned out so badly for women, 
there are a lot of conservatives who want to walk it back a few steps, you know, go back from hookups back to just, you know, traditional dating and serial monogamy. But again, that, that's a very transitional kind of coupling, as, as we talked about in part four, uh, where basically, you know, you, you go through a string of temporarily exclusive relationships that last a few months or maybe a few years before you finally settle into one that nobody really wants to end. But as we already talked about in part four, serial monogamy in that sense, that is what inevitably led to hookup culture in the first place. You can't just unravel half of a sweater and stop uh, keeping the rest completely intact. Even if you could go back, even if you could walk it back, you know, 30, 40 years, you just end up in exactly the same place in a few decades. So, with all the common ways, with all the easy ways uh, being ineffective, how do we fix it? And our only way forward is to recover the virtue of chastity. And what do I mean by that? What is chastity? First of all, it is not celibacy. That is something different. Celibacy is the vow that uh, nuns and monks take uh, to have absolutely no sex whatsoever at all. Chastity is different. Chastity is a virtue. And virtues are, are dispositions towards right behavior and against wrong behavior. And in the case of chastity, it's a disposition towards the proper use of our sexuality. Which in most cases, for most people, that means directing our sexuality towards marriage, fulfilling its purpose within a marriage. And there are certainly exceptions to that, you know, like the Apostle Paul, uh, people who have been gifted with a, a, a gift of, of celibacy. But, you know, most people, the vast majority of people, do not have that gift. And chastity, in contrast to celibacy, chastity is, is a positive aim for marriage. It's not just as, merely this negative no sex until marriage uh, that, that the church has been teaching for a, while, for a long time now. It's the fulfillment of sexuality within marriage. Which, again, by the way, that is precisely what the Apostle Paul instructs to young men and women who are having trouble controlling themselves. You know, gee, I wonder if there's any applicability of that nowadays. And doing that, uh, fulfilling your sexuality within marriage, I mean, that, that does entail waiting for marriage. But it can't stop there. It can't just be no sex until marriage. Because our biology doesn't wait forever. Celibacy, you know, it clearly hasn't worked for a whole lot of monks, a whole lot of nuns, a whole lot of priests. And essentially demanding that most Christian men and women stay celibate into their 30s? That doesn't work a whole lot better. That is not a reasonable expectation for, for people in the most fertile years of their lives. And you know, you might also notice that in all the examples we've talked about through this, this entire series, all the messy cases, all the victims, all the bad stuff that's happened, chastity by even one of the people involved in any of those cases, that would have removed the worst parts of all of those situations altogether. So we need to teach chastity. That's how we get out of this. But there is another part to it that we need to be very clear on. And that's that we have to teach men to be chaste. And we have to also teach women to be chaste. It has to be both. And certainly that's true on the theoretical level because chastity aims at marriage and marriage requires both a man and a woman. Uh, again, more, more on that in another video series uh, someday, maybe. But for now, if sexuality is to be directed towards marriage, there have to be social factors that create a pathway towards marriage for both men and for women. And, you know, if you get uh, women on board with marriage, but men re aren't really interested in it, or if you get men on board with marriage, but women aren't really interested in it, marriages aren't going to happen very easily. Both sexes have to be on board. But this is also true on a practical level, uh, within our current situation specifically. And it took me a while to realize this because it is fairly counterintuitive, but it's nevertheless true. The women who are involved in hookup culture are its primary victims. That, that's absolutely true. But they are also the ones who create and maintain hookup culture in the first place. And I'm going to explain this by an analogy. Um, I think this came from, from uh, the blogger Dal Rocker originally, but I, I'm not entirely sure on that. Um, think about men in porn. You know, you, you catch your son looking at pornography. 
Well, what do you tell them? Do you tell them, hey, look, you don't have to watch any porn if you don't want to. Is that how you approach it? Do you tell them that, look, I know everybody looks at porn. I know everybody watches porn these days. But you can't let anybody pressure you into watching any pornography that you are uncomfortable with. Of course not. Of course you're not going to address it that way. Because the whole reason he's watching porn in the first place, it's not because of social pressure. It's because he wants to see attractive women doing the kinds of things he'd like that kind of woman to do with him. That is why he's watching it, because he wants to. And now it's certainly true that men are the primary victims of pornography. It is, it's a massive industry that does all that it can to shove it into people's faces these days. And men today, we, we, we face an absolutely unprecedented level of temptation uh, when, when, it, when it comes to pornography. But at the same time, the whole reason it is a massive industry in the first place is because men are huge consumers of it. There, there is something broken in fallen male nature that makes us susceptible to that sort of thing. And so we are the victims of pornography. But we are simultaneously the ones who create it and maintain it in the first place. And there's a very similar dynamic at work with women and hookup culture. Women are the primary victims of hookup culture, but they are the biggest consumers and enablers of it as well. There's a whole lot more going on in the situation than just, oh, oh, those poor innocent girls are being abused and and bullied and exploited by those evil sex-crazed porn-addled men when all they're looking for is just a little bit of emotional intimacy. And that, that was the whole message that the Pornline article we talked about a few, a few uh, parts ago. That, that was the whole message of that article that everybody was sharing, conservatives, liberals alike. The girls are just looking for emotional intimacy, intimacy and they're just it, all these evil men are, are taking advantage of them. But even in that article, even in that article itself, it's, it's very, very clear that there is something else going on in that situation. And, you know, make no mistake, that article, it, it, it describes absolutely atrocious behavior on, on the part of the young men. And I, I believe that those reports are, are essentially true, and, and it's terrible, and of course that needs to stop. But that's not the entire story either, because both the, the survey uh, and, and the author's own engagement with the youth were exclusively with young women. You only get half the story if you only talk to half the people involved. And if you doubt that the other half could could possibly matter in the face of atrocious behavior like that, consider this. Uh, the Pornline article says that the boys are using uh, the nude pictures that, that they uh, get from the girls um, as a kind of social currency that they trade around. So, in a sense, they're creating their own portfolios of the girls that they've used. And the bigger portfolios mean uh, more social wealth. They're, they're a kind of status symbol. And of course, if, if it's being used as a social currency, some boys are richer and some boys are poorer. Some have high status, some have low status, some don't have any status at all. And that means that the, the richest, if, if you want to call it that, the ones with the biggest portfolios, they're the biggest jerks and, and the biggest abusers of them all, the biggest exploiters, you know, because they have all those pictures because they've exploited more girls than anybody else. So, so they're the worst of the worst, right? So, why are the biggest jerks of the entire bunch, why are they the ones that the girls are most likely to provide with sexual access? Why are they the ones that they're giving the pictures to, that they're seeking relationships with? Why are these the guys that the girls are going after, that they're, that they're worried about saying no to them. Because that is why they have the biggest portfolios in the first place, because the girls are providing it to them. And if the girls are, are just looking for a little bit of emotional intimacy, why are they so much more likely to look for emotional intimacy from the biggest jerks of the bunch? That seems like a really strange place to be looking for emotional intimacy. And if you can't answer that, if you can't, if you can't answer why that's going on, why that dynamic is in place, then you cannot fix hookup culture either. 
But if you do get the other side of the story, if, if you talk to the guys who are involved, either uh, the, the guys who are either in hookup culture or on the periphery of hookup culture, meaning that, they, uh, that, that they're either involved it themselves or that they wish they were involved, what they'll generally tell you is, is that 80% of the girls are hooking up with about 20% of the guys. And I mean, the 80-20 figure precisely, I mean, that comes from, based on the Pareto principle. Um, and I mean, that's almost certainly an exaggeration. But even if you look at it statistically, there is a disparity there. Young women are now more likely to be sexually active than young men. Particularly once you take into account the fact that uh, other studies have shown that men lie on surveys about their sexual history in order to exaggerate how many people that they've been with. And women lie on, on surveys about sexual history in order to minimize the number of people that they have with. So the disparity there is probably deeper than what the statistics uh, initially show. Meaning that hookup culture is a larger group of women hooking up with a smaller group of men. And the men without sexual access uh, who wish they were a part of hookup culture um, they're generally quite willing to offer actual relationships and emotional intimacy in exchange for sexual access, basically to date, which is what the Pornland girls were all asking for in the first place. But they have a really hard time finding any women who are willing, to, to, to the point that a whole lot of men are just giving up altogether. Uh, there, there's one guy that I know that, uh, he's, he's only a few years younger than me, and back when he was in college, uh, he, was, he was looking for a relationship. And I remember him complaining that the girls aren't interested in anything other than sex. So just like men are the biggest consumers and, and therefore enablers of pornography, women are the biggest consumers and therefore enablers of hookups. And again, maybe we'll talk about why in another series, because it's, it's rooted in some of the natural differences between men and women. But when you get both sides of the story, it is undeniably the case. And that is the other big problem with interpreting all of this as a matter of rape culture rather than hookup culture. Um, of course, rape culture is a symptom of hookup culture, and it's you know, generally better to treat the cause rather than the symptoms. But even beyond that, rape is generally thought of as something that men commit against women, and, and it generally is. It can go the other way, but it, it, it's generally not that way. So... If you fight rape culture specifically, and that's where the lion's share of your attention is going to be on fixing men and affirming women. But you can't teach chastity that way. Because you could be effective beyond your wildest dreams. You, you could reach, you know, say, 80% of young men and teach them to be chaste. But if you just focus on the men, the other 20% that you don't reach, and there's always going to be that portion that you never reach they're still going to be hooking up with 80% of the women. And, and this is reinforced because of the way all of us generally try to avoid calling out women for their bad behavior these days. Um, on the left, that's generally due to feminism. You know, the idea that women are oppressed and they need to break free and, and, and chastity is just one more form of bondage and, and even mentioning it is some kind of slut-shaming or something. And the same thing happens on the right for different reasons. Uh, conservatives tend to avoid calling out women because of chivalry. Um, the, the, te the tendency to you know, put women on pedestals, uh, act as though they aren't fallen human beings just like men are. But no, we need to teach chastity to both men and to women. You have to do both or we're never going to get out uh, of this huge mess that we're in. And you know what? Teaching and exhorting chastity that does not prevent the basic human care that, that's needed by all the victims uh, of, of this huge mess that we're in. And that's always the assumption. You can never tell anybody that they're wrong, um, even obliquely, even politely, even gently. You have to affirm them in everything in order to love them, and it's just not true. There is a reason that God never authorized his church to withhold the law. Now, we should certainly be judicious about it, um, you, don't, you don't hammer people who are already broken. And many, maybe most even, uh, victims are already convicted in some way by the law written on their hearts. Um, so you're, you're not trying to use the law and, and sexual morality as this kind of weapon to get the, the right emotional reaction out of them. That's just manipulation. 
what you are trying to do is to, to gently build on the things that they already know so that they can understand it better. And it's very useful to be able to make some sense of what happened to them and why it happened to them and, and what's going on around them. If, if you watch horror movies at all, then you're, you're going to notice that the creatures are, are, are generally a lot scarier the less that you know about them. You know, the shark in Jaws is scarier before you see the shark. And it's, it's just basic fear of the unknown. You know, the reason we're all scared of the dark when we're kids. But I found that having a convincing explanation of how things went wrong, how things are supposed to look in contrast, that provides a, a great deal of comfort by taking away that, that shroud of mystery that, that makes everything so unknown. And yeah, when you do that, you find out along the way about things that you shouldn't have done. And when you find out about things you shouldn't have done, it triggers unpleasant feelings of shame. But that is what the gospel is for. To save us from the penalties of the law, because Christ paid for it all on our behalf. He carried our shame when he was executed like a common criminal. We need that. Because if all we get is law, if that's all we focus on, well, all we're going to be doing is, is, is going to be more and more broken because we have all fallen short of God's law. So this whole thing comes full circle. If Christians are interested in fighting rape culture, and we should be, then we need to be faithfully proclaiming both law and gospel, teaching the whole counsel of God. And if we neglect either one of those, then we are not doing our jobs. And that is where we are going to end this series. Thank you so much for sticking with it this whole time, listening to the entire thing. And if you got anything worthwhile out of it at all, like it, share it, comment, so that others can get something out of it as well. And if you would, please subscribe to the channel, because there will be more content like this coming down the road. After all, the devil never sleeps, and so the Reformation never ends.